All right, welcome everybody to our talk about holidays and your backyard fruit with the Oriental fruit fly in your area. Um, this presentation is kind of geared around the holidays. We have Thanksgiving coming up and then a number of winter holidays that run through um, early February. And a lot of times when people are, you know, during the holiday season, there's a lot of traveling. And one of the things that's wonderful about Southern California is there's a lot of uh, fruit to share and abundance of uh, produce to share in the winter time. It's one of the things that makes Southern California so wonderful and so unique is when other people have snow and gloomy weather, we've got beautiful sunshine, sometimes snow on the mountains and a lot of produce. So this presentation is geared around the quarantine area that's been triggered by the Oriental fruit fly, um, but it still applies to surrounding areas. The principles still apply in general. And if you know anybody who's traveling to these areas, um, then I encourage you um, to uh, be aware of this. Also, there are actually a number of fruit fly quarantines. So I'm just going to take a little note um, to remember. So I'm going to, if you are traveling outside of the area, you may be entering a different fruit fly quarantine. And these things would basically all apply to that area as well. Real quick, the Master Gardeners, that's who we are. We're the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners. Each county has a program. We're under the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources under the University of California. We're not associated directly with any particular university like Riverside or Irvine or LA. We're not part of the campus system. We're part of the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division. Our Master Gardeners are trained volunteers who educate the public, and we share peer-reviewed research um, done by the University of California and other universities. And we like to focus on growing food, sustainable landscaping, and better living through gardening. In addition to the Master Gardener program, each county has a cooperative extension office, and that cooperative extension office has a number of different programs. I think almost all of them have a Master Gardener program. 17 or so have a Master Food Preserver program, and you'll hear from them later. We have a nutrition program, FNEP. Some counties have CalFresh. And then we have a 4-H program in our county. And most counties, I think, have a 4-H program. And we also have an environmental education program. So that's us in a nutshell. And we all work together to get research-based information out to the public. When it comes to the master gardeners and master food preservers, we're really just passionate plant people who love to share our knowledge with the public. And the master food preservers are people who are very passionate about food preservation, food security, food safety, and um, being able to control what you feed yourself and your family. In addition to the master, um, uh, sorry, with the Master Gardener program, in addition to the presentations we do and the information tables, we also have a seed library. We get donated um, seeds that are donated to us and we share those out with the public for free. If you're interested in some of those free seeds, you can find us at an event near you. We might be at a farmer's market. We're also at the Highland Library on the second Saturday of each month from 11 to 1 and the Ontario Ovit Library on the third Saturday of each month. And then we have free seed saving classes. We've done them for years. We took a little break during the spring and summer because we were really busy, but we'll start those again. So if you're interested in seed saving, then check those out on our website. We also have a helpline. You can, uh, if you have gardening questions, if you have questions about what to plant right now, if you have follow-up questions about this oriental fruit fly, if you have questions about trees, about your lawn, about um, soil care, about composting, you can reach out to our helpline. You can call them or email them. And we're also the second Saturday of each month in Highland uh, at the library when we give away free seeds. We also have a master gardener there who can answer your questions. Again, that's 11 to 1. And the second Sunday of each month, then we are at, um, we're online, we're all at home. And you can uh, just log on and ask us questions. And sometimes we do short presentations. And information about those events can be found on our website. And the cool thing about our helpline is you can um, email us photos and we can um, kind of help troubleshoot beyond you just describing the problem you might be having with your plants or the question you might have. Tonight we're talking about the oriental fruit fly, but I think it's important to um, not forget about citrus greening disease. This is another pest in the area. If you're in the oriental fruit fly area, 
citrus greening and its impacts directly impact you. Redlands has beautiful citrus groves that are owned by residents, they're owned by the city, they're owned by um, different community organizations, and citrus greening disease is a direct threat to that. And as those orange groves go out, go out it seems like um, warehouses are going in. So we still, even though we're worried about this oriental fruit fly, we also want to continue to protect our citrus trees. Citrus greening disease is um, very active right now in Ontario. They're finding a lot of trees that are um, testing positive for HLB or citrus greening disease. And um, while the weather reduced the number of insects that spread that disease, the insects they're finding seem to be carrying more of the bacteria that causes the disease. The disease is fatal to all citrus. It will kill the tree in about 10 years. It's not harmful to people, the bacteria that causes the disease, but it is fatal to citrus. The bacteria is, as I mentioned, spread by a tiny insect, the Asian citrusillid. And so tonight we're talking about a different pest, um, but together we can help prevent the spread of this um, citrus greening disease, another really important issue in the Redlands area. By not sharing fruit with stems and leaves, the insect is about the size of a half a grain of rice, and it can ride on the leaves or the larvae or um, eggs can ride on the leaves. So remove the stems and leaves, especially during the holiday time. People like to share mandarins and different citrus fruit. And if you're outside of the quarantine, um, so you're not infected, uh, outside of the fruit fly quarantine, so you can share fruit, make sure you're removing the stems and leaves. I just saw yesterday on social media, somebody posting about sharing cuttings and the trees can, even though they're carrying a fatal disease, a fatal bacteria, the citrus trees can look healthy for a couple years. So if you're sharing cuttings, you may be sharing infected citrus without knowing it and spreading the disease to other trees. Or if you're getting and receiving cuttings, you may be getting a diseased wood and not realize it. And then another big one is keeping ants out of your trees. Um, ants keep beneficial predators away. And so by keeping ants out of your trees, the beneficial predators can come in and do their job. And then the other thing you can do is just tell your friends and family that even though we have this oriental fruit fly that's causing huge problems, we still have the citrus screening disease and we don't wanna forget about that. And we need to take these steps to prevent the spread of the disease. I wanted to note real quick, these are the symptoms of Huang Long Bing or HLB, another name for citrus greening disease. And you can see it sort of has this asymmetrical yellowing. On the left-hand side is something you'll see maybe a little bit late in the year, but in the spring and fall, you'll see this on citrus. It will cause a lot of uh, deformation of the foliage. You'll see this little like silver track here on the leaf and it looks kind of like the snail or a slug has been on there. Um, and that is a citrus leaf miner. So sometimes when they hear about this citrus greening disease, which causes uh, you know, the trees to die, and it's a really big pest um, or disease worldwide, causing a lot of damage to citrus. Florida has almost no, no backyard citrus left. Um, then this looks really bad, but it's actually the citrus leaf miner. And usually that damage is just cosmetic unless the tree is very small. And um, this symptoms, these symptoms on the right are uh, the fatal disease and it's this asymmetrical yellowing. If you have more questions about the citrus disease, reach out to our helpline. We'll make sure to share that information with you and you can find it on our website. And so reach out to our helpline for more information. So together we can prevent the spread of the disease. Here's a little picture of the insect or a big picture. The insect is about the size again of a half a grain of rice. Alrighty, okay, back to our Oriental fruit fly presentation. This is the first one that we're doing um, for cooperative extension in San Bernardino County. Um, the master gardeners and master food preservers. The quarantine was first announced to the public around the end of September, I think on the 29th. They probably found the flies, um, you know, approximately 10 days or two weeks before that. There's a lot of steps to them declaring the quarantine. And once they found the flies and declared the quarantine, that was September 29th. So since then, it's been about a month and a half and the master gardeners and master food preservers are working together to help you guys, the residents, um, manage your fruit and figure out what you can do with your fruit. If you're joining from outside the quarantine, um, you know, you may not be quite as aware. If you're joining from inside the quarantine, 
or inside the core area. And I don't want to make a mistake about the distance. So I don't want to tell you the distance, but a core area is a location or an area very near a find of insects. And so they have regular trapping that goes on throughout the state for different pests. You've probably seen ag, um, ag um, commissioner, agricultural, ag weights and measures, and it's the agriculture side. Those uh, field agents out, maybe they're putting traps for mosquitoes, maybe they're checking for different kind of exotic fruit flies. They may be checking for the Asian citrus psyllid that spreads that citrus greening disease. And so they've all been out there um, trapping. And so once they find larvae or adult flies, which is what happened probably about mid-September, then that will trigger a quarantine. And the quarantine sort of expands. So if you have, for example, you know, if they fly find a fruit fly over here on the right, then it will have a quarantine that is an actual circle of a certain radius around it. And then they'll have a larger quarantine around that. And <laughs> these are supposed to be perfect circles around that X right there. So use your imagination. And um, the area inside is called the core. And if you are in the core area, that means they found an insect fairly near you. I don't remember off the top of my head if it's a mile or 500 feet. I don't even want to guess and I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Um, you should have been notified. You should have gotten a letter. They're also sending field agents out to people's houses just to let them know. Um, and people within the core area, they call it, have certain regulations. And people in the area that's outside of the core area, um, that is sort of a buffer around there so that they can control the spread and keep it from spreading into non-infected areas. So first of all, if you are directly impacted by this quarantine, meaning that you're inside the quarantine, you should know. You should have gotten a letter, but I'm going to show you the map in a little bit. Um, and if you don't know, now you know. And so we're here tonight to talk a little bit about the response. Um, you know, if you're in the core area, you have different things that you can do with your fruit than if you're outside of the core area. Um, and there's different responses that commercial organizations have to follow. So tonight we'll talk just a little bit about the biology of the fly, the impacts of the infestation, how to detect it, why it matters, what you can do. And then the master food preservers are gonna share kind of a part one of um, some education on how you can process fruit if you're in the area. And I just wanna start with, um, you know, for many, many years, um, whether it's at a county or city, probably not really a city, but like a county or state or federal level, then there's always been regulations around bringing exotic pests and diseases into the country. Uh, Hawaii is a great example of a state or a region that has been really impacted by a lot of outside agricultural movement um, that's brought in a lot of diseases and pests that have been very destructive. You have these wonderful ecosystems, you know, like Hawaii is out in the middle of an island and the chance of spread before air, air travel, you know, a couple hundred years ago, this ecosystem existed in a really, you know, pure, maybe not pure, but a more pure form and was able to thrive. And then as air travel increased and our economy has become global and, and we really are a global society at this point, all of this air travel and all of these people living all over the world who are um, coming from different countries, whether they're coming from the States or coming to the States, then um, we all like to bring plants with us. I remember when I was learning about seed saving and they were talking about um, different, um, like Benjamin Franklin and um, some different people who, I forgot who it was, who was a, a signer on the Declaration of Independence and how he brought spinach over for many, many thousands of years, people have brought seeds and plants with them. So it's a little bit challenging because as we move, we want to bring the things that we find, you know, that are near and dear to our heart and that are um, part of our culture and our history. And when we visit places, we see cool things and we want to bring them back. I mean, this is sort of like human nature, um, but it's causing a lot of problems. And so just a few years ago, there was a med fly quarantine, both in Devore and Upland. 
and they were able to trace the DNA of that back to Hawaii. So most likely somebody either smuggled something in through their luggage that was undetected and there was fly larvae or, you know, some kind of pest in there, um, or it was something that was shipped. If you go to, I can't remember how to find it, but if you go to like your um, ag commissioner's pages for different counties, they list interceptions of packages that are coming into like FedEx and the different shipping um, main um, hubs. And the number of interceptions on a, in a weekly basis is just amazing. I mean, not like on a monthly basis, it's like hundreds of things, depending on which area it is. And in Southern California, there's a lot of things coming in in Long Beach, coming, you know, at the harbor, coming across the border from the south and the east. Um, so it sounds kind of nerdy. And it's I remember with my daughters um, or my kid's father, um, we brought beetle nut over from the tropical island they were from because they chewed it and they missed it. So I am guilty of packing illegal um, plant material. But now that I understand the repercussions, um, I would probably make different choices. So if you can even just be an advocate for encouraging people not to pack a pest, you know, don't bring something that has soil from another place. You know, um, usually if you buy plants at nurseries, they'll have some kind of certificate and nurseries where people travel across the state lines or like unusual things, they'll have a certificate that can cross the state lines. So just if nothing else, if you just take away from this presentation the importance of um, you know yourself not moving produce illegally um, and uh, just sharing that messaging, that is really important because in California, on average, we have about 75-ish exotic fruit fly detections per year. And this year, up to the last Friday, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like 735. So we've gone from 75 per year to um, a little over 700. And those 700 have been detected over the last few months. And in San Bernardino, 500 of those alone are in San Bernardino County and Riverside County. And San Bernardino and Riverside County are part of the largest quarantine in California history for exotic fruit flies. So this is a really big deal. It really snuck up on us. Um, it's definitely unprecedented. Um, so first of all, just, um, I hope you guys see the importance of not packing a pest. I didn't really see the importance. A lot of times we think the rules don't apply to us or we're going to be careful. That's how I thought with the beetle nut. And now I'm like, uh oh, I'm part of the problem, but we all have an opportunity to learn and make changes. So don't pack a pest. And if you are at a different region, like even in California, and if you see any kind of um, tags on a plant from the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, or other labels, read those, because um, they're there for a reason. And sometimes, you know, nobody likes regulation or people telling us what to do, but their role is to um, manage pests, and they have a pretty good strategy, but the strategy relies heavily on us um, following the procedures that have been tested through time. So to our oriental fruit fly, and again, if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself, um, and I'm happy to take those. If I haven't explained something clearly or um, you have a follow-up question, um, don't be shy to unmute or put it in the chat. So the common name, this is the oriental fruit fly. Here is the male and female. Um, they look a lot different than I thought they did. Um, they're about eight millimeters in length. So they're a little bit bigger than a housefly. Um, I was thinking of them as like the little tiny, you know, pencil tip or double pencil tip sized um, fly, but these are actually quite a large fly. The body is bright yellow and it has sort of a dark T shape marking on its back. The wings are clear and the female, you can see the ovipositor where she would lay the eggs. And then the maggots just look like fly maggots and they're actually about 10 millimeters. So they're actually quite big. And that's one of the problems of why they're so destructive is because they're quite a large maggot um, or larvae for this fruit fly. So here it is, here's the troublemaker just doing its thing. But this fly is really problematic. The range, um, it looks like it originated from Southeast Asia and it's also, um, spread rapidly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
after being introduced only about two decades ago. In the uh, 40s, it went into Hawaii, and it's a major pest. Again, because of the fly size and the larvae size, it's really destructive. So it's not just um, like a cosmetic damage, like, you know, that citrus leaf miner that I showed you a picture of a few minutes ago. The damage on the leaf was really bad, but that's mostly cosmetic. This lays eggs in the fruit and it ruins the fruit. The way that the quarantine duration is set up, the quarantine is um, started in September and it was supposed to end in May. It was supposed to last about, what is that, about nine months. And the idea is that in order to end the quarantine, then they want to go through three life cycles of the larvae, I mean, of the fly. So the fly life cycle, it is only about 30 days. It's not three months, but they're also factoring in the winter because the way they determine the life cycle, if you've ever watched like CSI or some kind of crime show and they find a body in the desert and then the entomologist, you know, the insect person comes and they're like, oh, based on the larvae and the temperatures, this body was put here like six days ago. And so they can figure that out. Um, they can also determine the fly life cycle depending on how long um, it's at a certain degree for how many hours. So, and they call it like a degree day. So I think a day would then would be like 24 hours. So it needs about 34 degrees. Um, well, anyway, it's a little bit complicated chart and I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but basically, they are basing this quarantine off of uh, three life cycles of the fly. And the idea is that like right now, they're still finding, at least as of last week, they're still finding larvae of the fly, even a month and a half after the quarantine. And that means that the fly is still breeding. It takes about two weeks for the eggs to hatch. So as far as we can tell, they're still breeding populations. The way that they trap this fly is uh, for med flies, they will, or Mediterranean fruit flies. Um, if you were alive in the 80s in Southern California, you might remember the malathion spraying that they did. And since then, they have come up with a strategy of uh, releasing sterile males into a medfly population. So in the medfly pop outbreak in Devore and Upland, then they were able to release sterile males and the males mate with the females and then the females then are not producing larvae or eggs, you know, viable eggs, and then they die off and there's no more population. With the oriental fruit fly and that one, the med fly, the quarantine is a little bit shorter because it's a pretty effective strategy that they are able to use with the med fly. And after two life cycles, they're able to be pretty confident that if so they'll, they'll release the sterile males into the first life cycle. There may be a few stragglers, which would be the second life cycle, but then there's no more males usually to breed or no more breeding females. So the population dies off. With the oriental fruit fly, um, the way they're trapping um, I, the sterile males must not work. It's not the protocol and the protocol is based on research. And so they're not doing a sterile male fly release. They have traps that lure the males out of the population. So they're attracted to the traps instead of the females. There may be other reasons as well, but that's part of what makes this quarantine a longer quarantine is just the strategy on how they manage the population. So if you're wondering, if you're part of the quarantine and you're wondering when it's going to end or why it hasn't ended yet, um, then it's based on the life cycles and there have to be, I think it's one whole life cycle where they're not detecting any larvae at all. So in their, in their field, um, testing, trapping, looking for flies that they're not finding any larvae, um, or any new flies. Um, so if they're keep, if they keep finding flies, then they're going to keep extending the quarantine. And again, that's just based on like how many life cycles. So if we have a very cold winter, um, that could possibly extend the quarantine, or if we have an early spring, usually they don't end the quarantine early, but the temperatures we have in the spring will um, impact this. And on a side note, if we do have um, like a really cool spring or winter and um, 
there aren't a lot of detections of the flies, but that, that's not really surprising because the temperatures are cooler and the flies are kind of like overwintering. So um, what's gonna be really telling is how many flies they're finding in the spring. Um, and you know, I don't expect you guys to remember this. This is just to give you guys a little background on how that works. If you have any questions, again, let me know. There's a couple blogs, or this blog is in English and Spanish um, and has some great information and a good description. We can put these in the chat and I can email these to everybody who registered as well. There's a couple other resources, an oriental fruit fly fact sheet, a, a map with regulation and quarantine boundaries. We're gonna look at that. And then right now let's look at the host list. And so two things make this fly really destructive compared to some other flies. Um, and this this fly just for, you know, this is an exotic fruit fly. This is not a fruit fly that's established in California. And we definitely want to keep it this way. Um, it's a fly. It's, you know, you can remember it's like 10 millimeters. Like the adult fly is about eight millimeters, a little bit bigger than a house fly. And the larvae is, can be up to 10 millimeters. It's really destructive. It breeds I think it said a female can lay up to a thousand eggs in their life cycle. Um, so they're really active. And the host list of plants that they feed on is over 230 types of fruits. And so let's look at the host list right now, just to give you just, we'll just glance at the host list real quick. Um, I just want to note, and I'll reach out to them. Um, this is one of the resources we're sharing. Um, the list here says Oriental Fruit Fly. Um, it does say on the PDF Mediterranean fruit fly, but it is the correct Oriental fruit fly host list. So you can see it's a three page list. It's pretty extensive. Um, we'll talk a little bit. I found this list to be pretty overwhelming. It's like basically everything. Um, but then I kind of pieced it apart and it was not so overwhelming or intimidating. Okay, so this is the list. Um, I can share this list before I forget right now with you in the chat, and we'll email this out to you as well. And we're putting, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so that's the host list, pretty extensive. So the impacts of fly infestation. Obviously, we talked about damaged fruit. Um, there's the risk of the fruit fly establishing. I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, if this fruit fly establishes in California, in the Redlands area, it's going to be devastating. Um, it has impacts if we are shipping fruit outside of the quarantine to people in other regions in California. And then also once a quarantine is established, um, the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, they need to notify our foreign trading partners. And, um, you know, I think there's definitely some things in our food system that could be fixed. Um, a lot of our produce from the Inland Empire um, gets shipped out of the country, at least in terms of like citrus. There's a big market outside of the country. Um, I have opinions about maybe it would be great if that could stay local, um, but that's not the way it's set up right now. And it is important. The other hat that I wear, in addition to being with the Master Gardener program, is I'm also with our local Farm Bureau. And the more I'm learning about for farmers, the more I'm understanding and like really understanding that farming has to be, you know, most farmers aren't in it for the profit, but if you're not able to pay your costs, it becomes pretty unsustainable. And so a lot of them rely on foreign markets uh, to ship citrus um, because that's where the market is, or they ship it out of the area to be processed on a larger scale and brought into the market that way. So once we're in a quarantine area, our partners have to be notified and so far, none of them, as far as I um, know to date, have not severed relationships with us, but it means that we can't sell to them right now. Um, in the Redlands, and now it's expanded into the Riverside area, there's a huge race between agriculture and uh, warehouse development. And also there's a need for housing. And so a lot of um, agriculture areas are getting um, becoming from citrus screening that we talked about earlier, the profits are going down and it's becoming harder and harder to be a farmer in our area. This uh, oriental fruit fly is just devastating our local farmers. Um, they're losing an entire year of a crop and a lot of farmers really don't have the cushion financially 
to go more than a year or two without um, at least uh, covering their costs. And, you know, a lot of us are in that situation just on a home, um, you know, and on our own budget. So one of the impacts of this fly is the potential loss of agriculture that might be permanent. You know, once those warehouses get put in, I don't think those Chino dairies are coming back. I don't think that those um, citrus groves in Redlands are coming back. Um, there's a lot of community gardens that have sprung up after the pandemic. Some of them have been here for a long time and they were just kind of under the radar. But with all the food insecurity that we have in our area, there's a lot of community gardens that have popped up to give people a space outdoors where they can enjoy themselves and also a source of produce. There's a really cool garden in uh, Highland Highlands Giving Garden. They have some social media pages and a website. You could check them out. And they donate a lot of food to food banks that they grow. They're now in the quarantine and not able to move that fruit off of their site. So this is also going to impact food security at the local level. And so slowing down this pest so that the quarantine can end in a timely ma matter is really important. Um, there was a question in the chat. Is it safe for us to buy fruit trees in the affected area? Great question. So fruit trees... If you're talking about citrus fruit trees, um, just to, even if that, I'll answer both questions. I'm um, just for anybody who might have this question. So you want to buy a citrus fruit tree near you because of a different quarantine, that citrus greening quarantine, which is controlling that. Um, and if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer those at the end. If you're worried about the, uh, like, or if you're purchasing non-citrus fruit trees, um, then most of the time those are very very rarely do you see like some you usually don't see fruit on a young tree if you do see fruit on a tree it's been in the container for a while and you probably don't want to buy it um so as long as there's no fruit on it um buying fruit from um reputable organizations is um, totally fine to buy fruit trees when it comes to that the oriental fruit fly larvae does um oh, i guess i didn't really get into that so um the the oriental fruit fly i'll have to add a slide for that like i said at the very beginning this is our first messaging on this and i'm still trying to remember all the things i want to share so the oriental fruit fly just really quickly um i'm going to go back to a picture um it these ones are probably laying eggs it looks like they have this long ovipositor and the adult female will lay eggs just under the surface of the fruit skin and then the larvae will burrow into the fruit. And then when it's ready to pupate or turn into an adult, it will come back out of the fruit and drop into the soil. They usually lay their eggs on either like almost immature fruit, like it's not green fruit, but it's not gonna be like really overly ripe fruit. The idea when they lay the eggs is that the larvae will emerge before the fruit falls. And then the larvae will go drop into the soil. They'll pupate in the soil and they will emerge from the soil. So going back to your question about buying fruit trees, um, the only potential danger about buying fruit trees would be if somebody was growing fruit trees and keeping them under the shade of another fruit tree, which does happen sometimes. So maybe they have it under the shade of an orange tree or a lemon tree. It is possible for larvae to fall into that soil that's not going to be happening at the commercial nursery level. That would be more like, you know, sort of somebody growing fruit trees in their backyard to share with friends um, or something like that. So as long as you're purchasing it from a reputable nursery, buying fruit trees that are non-citrus within this quarantine should not be an issue because they shouldn't have any fruit on them that could be impacted. Okay. And so it is just the fruit that is impacted, the citrus greening, the insect that spreads citrus greening, it lays its eggs on the foliage. So with that insect, you have to worry about the foliage. This one, it's just the fruit. So the adult fly flies around and that one is, you know, it's just sort of cruising around like your average fly does. And so it's not contained because it can just fly around. And then the larvae would be either in the fruit or it would be falling into the ground and pupating in the soil and emerging as an adult fly from the soil. Okay, I'm working with the CDFA to find out um, a little bit more about mulching and to see if a thick layer of mulch might help reduce um, either the larvae establishing in the soil or emerging um, from the soil. 
If you had a three or four inch layer of mulch, like under your orange tree, for example, do not take away the message that that's effective. But I have heard people who have like um, a lot of June bugs or different kind of um, beetle larvae that, you know, cause a problem. Then they, um, what's that iridescent beetle? Uh, Asian, whatever that beetle is that is like big and it gets into peaches and stuff. I have heard people just kind of like offhandedly recommending a thick layer of mulch. I don't have any scientific research behind that. You know, it kind of makes sense. Um, it might prevent them from being able to burrow in the soil, but they may be able to live in the mulch. So don't quote me on that being an important um, or effective management. I'm looking into that and I'll keep you guys updated on future presentations. So if these community gardens aren't able to share their fruit or um, that, you know, you are not able to share your fruit, you know, that could have impacts on food security. You know, you may be gardening for fun, but there's a lot of gardening going on in the county that is um, a really a, an important source of nutrition for people. And then the other thing is that a, about a year and a half ago, that SB 1383 legislation rolled out to try to reduce food waste going into landfills and um, to kind of keep organic matter local. And if uh, under these um, fruit fly infestations, the recommendations are to put food in the trash, um, if you're, especially if you're in the core area. So while we're, while it's important to follow that regulation, the impact of the infestation is it also reduces our efforts to um, keep food waste out of the landfill. It's an important activity to keep it, um, you know, the fly from spreading, that's a higher priority right now. But that's another reason why we don't want this fly quarantine to continue and this fly to establish itself. Um, so kind of tied to that, why does it matter? You know, ending the quarantine is, is, is as soon as possible is good for everybody. I don't think they shorten quarantine. So right now it won't end before the end of June, um, but we don't want it to extend. Ag in our county, agriculture in our county is on the edge. There's so many pressures economically, um, space-wise, um, you name it. And so we want to help protect it. And ending this fruit fly quarantine is really important, especially for all the small growers who are trying to grow in our area. Um, it is, as I mentioned, the largest exotic fruit fly quarantine in California history. And there's a lot of agencies working together to respond, but this is really unprecedented. This is huge. And just to reinforce eradication or complete elimination of the fly is the goal. We don't want to be living with the fly. It's going to damage a lot of fruit, cost a lot of money, impact our foreign partnerships with um, produce sales, and be bad for community gardens and small gardens and urban farmers. So you know, normally like with other pests, we'll be like, how do you detect this pest? Just assume you have it if you're in the quarantine area. We'll look at the map in just a moment. We can look at the map real quick right now um, and see. Um, and again, I'll share these resources and we'll be adding them to our website. I'll drop this link in the chat. If you go to the website, they have kind of an uh, the California Department of Food and Agriculture's website. They have um, general information, like here is a quarantine map, I don't know, where did it go? Um, they have a quarantine map, um, but it's not super detailed. Take my word for it, because I can't find it right now. Here we go. Uh, so here's the map. Um, here's some other areas in the state that are being affected. Sacramento is being affected, but th these are only, these other quarantines are only about 90 square miles. Ours is over, I think, 350 square miles. So huge. Um, and the management practices, they're not finding any more larvae in these other quarantine areas. So their practices are working, their quarantine efforts are working. Um, in our area, it's still kind of unchecked. Also to note that there is um, a medfly quarantine in Los Angeles right now. There's a towel fruit fly quarantine in Los Angeles, and that fruit fly hasn't been seen in the Western Hemisphere. There's a Queensland fruit fly. I think that is in Ventura, if I remember correctly. Um, and that hasn't been seen in this area. So this has just been a really bad year for fruit flies. So they have these general maps that you can click on them, but they don't have a lot of detailed information. This one under the GIS mapping, the ArcGIS, this is much clearer. 
So if you're in this area or in surrounding areas, um, assume you have that fly if you're in the area. So I wouldn't even, this is not the kind of thing where it's like, look for the pest. And if you have the pest, you should respond. Assume you have it in your area. You can check fruit for damage. And if you do see damage, the CDFA has a phone number on all of their web pages you could call. But just assume that you have it. If you're in surrounding areas, if I were you, I would kind of assume that I might have it and I might take some proactive um, steps to manage it that I'll talk about in a little bit. The flies are generally attracted to specific lures that aren't available to the public. So setting out those yellow sticky traps to see if you have it is probably not going to be that helpful. That question was asked at a meeting to the CDFA and UD USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, a few uh, last week, and the response was that they're just not very effective. So just assume that you have it if you're in the quarantine. Act like you have it if you're in the quarantine. And if you're in a surrounding area, just be very cautious. Again, eradication is the goal. Um, and you want to follow the guidelines that are specific to your area. And if you don't know, you can either reach out to the CDFA. You can reach out to the Master Gardener Helpline if you have general questions. But if you're in the core area where um, the fruit fly has been found near you and they might need to um, pull all your fruit, they'll notify you. So all is not last, lost, but the key to success is with us. Let's look at the impact to you and what it, what you can do in smaller bites. So when I first looked at that, I was really overwhelmed when I looked at the host list. When I looked at the number of things that we grow, we probably grow 75% of what's on that list in the area, started to kind of freak out. Um, if you have an ag official, like from the Ag Weights and Measures Office from San Bernardino County, or the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, or the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, if any of those employees come to your house to give you a letter telling you about where you are in the quarantine, don't be shy to ask them questions. They have a tough job. People aren't usually happy to see them. They're bringing bad news. They work for the government. I do not envy their position, um, but they're here to help us. They're trying to help us to prevent. And I, I kind of the way I look at them is, you know, you and I all go to work and we do different things during the day at work, but these people are thinking about this fly like 24 hours a day. And so they are the ones who are making the concerted effort. So we don't have to like strategize this whole plan. We just need to follow, follow the guidelines that they've set in place. And they're the ones who are strategizing, but don't be shy to ask them questions and to, you know, understand what you can do, understand what your options are. If something is not clear to you, don't be shy to ask them questions. Um, they already know where you live if they're bringing you a letter or they're sending you a letter. So don't be shy about that. Reach out to the Master Gardener and the Master Food Preserver Program for help on how, you know, and maybe right now you may not be impacted either. You may not be in the quarantine area or you may not have something in season, but maybe three months from now you've got something in season and you don't know how to process it because you can't take it off your property and you've got, you know, 85 of something that you don't know what to do with. Um, or you have, you know, 10 citrus trees and all your oranges that you normally share with people. You can't take off your property. So just keep us in mind when you have questions about what to do. There's going to be monthly meetings. We're not going to do one in December, but starting in January, we'll do like a monthly update. And one of the things that we'll do with the monthly update is we'll give you guys an update on the quarantine, what's going on with the flies, with the management. And then the master food preservers will talk about what's in season right now. And the master gardeners will talk about, okay, this is where we are in the quarantine, thinking forward, what should you be planting for summer? And um, the other thing, as always with pests, is tell three people and tell them to tell three people. You know, however many people we have online, if you guys each told three people and told them to tell three people, probably have over 50 people just in that alone right there with that messaging. So spread the word, not the pest. So the scale of your response really depends on what you do with your fruit. Do you and your family usually consume all your fresh fruits or you prepare them? You may not really have much of an impact from this quarantine. If you are near a find or they find flies at your house, there may be you're in that core area. You may have to destroy your fruit. Um, hopefully that's not the case. Um, but if you are in a situation where they have to destroy the fruit, that's because the fly has been found on or very near your property. Um, if you're in a situation where you're not in the quarantine area, 
I mean, I'm sorry, not in the core area, but you're still in the quarantine, they're asking you not to move the fruit, fruit off your property. So if you usually just eat everything at home and you prepare it, then um, maybe your response is not going to have to be that big. Do you usually share a small amount of fruit with visitors, friends, and neighbors? Do you have people coming for the holidays and you normally share some of those beautiful Southern California citrus? If you're in the quarantine area, you don't want to do it. One of the USDA officials was telling me this example, which really kind of hit home to her and it's kind of stuck with me, which is say you share oranges that look perfectly fine because remember, even though the insect is fairly large, you might not see where that hole, where the egg has been laid. So say your friend comes from, you know, uh, San Francisco and you share with them a couple tangerines and they take those tangerines home or you share some um, apples or something and they take those home and then they cut into it and they find a maggot like a fruit fly larvae. Say they don't know about this quarantine, they don't know about the pest, so they just throw that um, half an apple or that cut open orange into their compost, open compost pile in their backyard and that fruit fly or fruit fly or two um, emerges and um, that could spread that fly to that area. Um, I know you need a couple to have a breeding population. So, you know, all the factors have to be right. But this is how these things spread. So if you do share with visitors and you are in the quarantine area, <clears throat> you should not be sharing any unprocessed fruit until the quarantine is up, <clears throat> which means through the entire holiday. I know it's tough and I know it's like you kind of just want to be like, oh, you know, make an exception, but our master food preserver in about five or 10 minutes is going to talk to you about a little bit about strategies for managing and processing. Um, and your cooperation now um, will help keep this quarantine from going on or from that fly establishing. So your decisions right now are really going to have an impact on you in six, nine, and, you know, months from now and years from now. So I'd rather sacrifice, you know, not sharing this season with my friends and family and be able to share in the future, okay? If you donate produce to a food bank, church, or other organization, um, this is really going to have a bigger impact on you. And again, if you're in the quarantine, you're not supposed to move that fruit from that property. So like the Highland Giving Garden that normally donates to a food bank now is not able to do that unless they process it. Um, if you have a community garden plot where you grow stuff and you bring it home, you're not supposed to do that either. We're not here to regulate. I'm just wanting to share, you know, the master gardeners, we're kind of here to share best practices. The government, the CDFA, the USDA, the Ag Office, they're in charge of regulation. I'm just giving you guys best practices. So if you do have a community garden plot that's in the quarantine and you live, you know, um, not near that area or outside of the quarantine um, and you have like late season tomatoes, you could be bringing those things home. Um, you know, and the other question is maybe you're just interested in learning how to process more of your produce so that you um, can kind of do different things with your produce. And now may be a great time to, to take the time to learn those skills. So this is a lot of information. This is sort of my brain on a slide. Um, I'm just going to throw it all at you. This is kind of what I see is like the decision tree. Um, for tonight, um, we've got about 10 minutes left, and maybe we're going to take about 15 minutes. Um, so I hope you guys can stay on for a few extra minutes. Um, but I'd like to just kind of put in your mind the things to think about. And then we'll be doing those presentations again in January. We have our helpline. You can reach out to myself and the Master Food Preserver Coordinator directly. We'll put our emails in the chat. D, maybe if you get a chance, you could put our email addresses in the chat. And so you know, don't think that you have to remember all of this stuff. I just want to let you know that these are things you should be thinking about, and we're here to help you decide these things, okay? So your decision tree would sort of, this is not a tree. I couldn't figure out how to do that on PowerPoint in a reasonable amount of time. But the first question is, are you in the quarantine area? Um, are you on the edge of the quarantine area? That's where I would be nervous because not yet in there. If, if I was in... 10 miles, of, just personally, if I was five to 10 miles from the quarantine boundary, I would sort of act like I had it on my property, the fly, um, just to be extra careful. Um, but you wouldn't be under those same requirements by the CDFA. You wouldn't be under those regulations, but just as a best practices, 
I would say, and if you're just very close to the edge, I would act like you're in the quarantine is my personal advice to you. Um, are you in a core area? In a core area, you may not um, be able to keep your fruit. They may um, dispose of your fruit because there's been a find on or near your property. If you have more than 25 citrus trees, and I'm pretty sure it applies to other trees, you are technically a commercial operation. There's a lot of people who have, we call them 25 plusers, you know, citrus or avocados. Um, and as a note, um, avocados are on the host list for this fly, but they were able to do some research and Hass avocados are not on the host list for this fly. But if you have more than 25 trees, you are considered commercial and you do fall under other regulations. Feel free to email me um, and I can kind of wear my Farm Bureau hat and help you navigate that. Um, just one second. Um, so that's another question that you can ask yourself. Um, think about what fruits are ready to harvest. I think that um, the easiest way is even though there's like 140 things on that one list and it involves like over 230 crops, then um, not all of them are ripe right now. And most of your cool season veggies, this insect infects the fruit or infests, um, lays eggs in the fruit. The foliage is not an issue. So the cool season crops, the lettuces, the radishes, the carrots, the, um, uh, you know, leafy vegetables, the broccoli, the cauliflower, all of that stuff is not on the host list. Um, strawberries are also not on the host list. Um, so there's a lot of things right now that you could grow that are not on the host list. Um, and the things, the main things that the Master Food Preserver Coordinator and I have thought of are citrus that's going to be coming up. Um, a lot of the citrus is ripe now through, you know, March and April. Um, there is avocados that are non hass There is persimmons, pomegranates. Those are kind of the things that you probably have on. You may have late season tomatoes or bell peppers. Those could be a potential um, host for this. So just keep that in mind. And just as a note, you know, like eating the larvae like doesn't hurt you. A little bit of extra protein, I suppose, kind of gross maybe um, if you're not into that kind of thing. But the larvae is not going to hurt you. So don't be concerned on that level. Um, there was a question. I'm going to finish this list and then answer the question in the chat. Um, so think about what fruits you have ready now. And I'm going to go through the list. Oh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, think about what fruits you usually harvest before the end of June when the quarantine is going to end. One of the things that I was thinking about is early harvest apricots. There's a few stone fruit that sometimes can be ready in early summer. So those may be impacted and you may not be able, and especially like for apricots, a lot of people share them because they will be a big crop and they'll all be ready on like Tuesday. You know, they won't be ready on Sunday and then on Tuesday they're all ripe. Um, and so now you're maybe not going to be able to give those away if the quarantine is still going on. Um, also think about um, what processes interest you if you'd like to share produce or planning to consume it all on site. So like if you are thinking about, hey, you know, you still want to share persimmons, but um, the master food preserver can talk about a method like for persimmons to dry them. Another big question is, do you compost? If you compost, we'll talk about that in just a moment, or vermicompost, composting with worms. Think about how you dispose of excess fruit. The guidelines from the CDFA are that you should double bag it in a trash bag, um, but we'll talk about that again in just a moment with composting. And then also if the quarantine, if you are able to join our upcoming presentations, especially the ones in like February and March, We'll be talking about if we're still on target to end the quarantine in late June so that you can have a nice summer harvest. Um, but if this quarantine extends through next summer, this is going to impact your tomatoes. So if you have a community garden plot and you normally plant 10 tomatoes and you bring them all home and you process them at home, that may not be an option, a safe option. So maybe if the quarantine expands, then next summer you just do a much smaller um batch of um, things at your community garden, or maybe you do more herbs or, and we'll cover stuff like that at upcoming presentations. Um, so just remember that uh, on the right is the guidelines that from the CDFA for homeowners um, or residents, I mean, 
um, and how to prevent it. And basically, you know, you're not to move fruit off the property if you're in the quarantine area. And if you are in the core area, and there was a question in the chat, is the core area defined? Yes, the core area is defined. It's not readily public information because they want to protect the confidentiality of residents who flies are found on their property. If people are able to determine where flies are found, people may be less comfortable allowing the CDFA to put traps on their property. So um, the core area information, um, you can contact the CDFA and they can tell you if you're in the core area. So it is defined, but it's not readily available public information because of uh, privacy. You don't want to let fallen fruit sit on the ground. Um, don't let fruit stay on the tree. Sometimes with citrus, you leave it on the tree for a long time. That may not be a great idea, um, and you may want to harvest it um, early to keep it from being a breeding ground from flies. Um, oh, and I didn't finish this, uh, but don't dispose of your fruit uh, casually. And I think my next slide, I'll talk about composting. So be careful of how you um dispose of the fruit peels and the fruit waste. The guidelines from the CDFA for fruit waste is that it gets bagged and put in the trash. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about composting in just a moment. So in summary, uh, your next steps are to look at the list of host plants um, on your property that you might be impacted by or at your community garden. Identify um, which ones you have. Um, and think about, okay, you've got, you know, oranges and you've got um, persimmons. Think about what you want to do with it. Is it on your property and you can eat it fresh? Is it at another location where you need to process it with minimal effort before you move it over? And we'll talk more about that processing in just a moment. Um, are you wanting to maybe, you know, like do some larger scale processing that you maybe have thought about but haven't done yet? And so the master food preservers over the next couple of months will talk about different things as they come up seasonally. And then the last thing that's really important to do is keep up to date on the quarantine size and end date by checking the website and attending our upcoming presentations where we'll also share that information with you. It's important if you are composting, you know, the proper compost process should kill larvae and eggs and it should prevent feeding from host uh, the adults. So. You don't want uncovered fruit, essentially. So if you are composting outside, you want to make sure you're covering that compost really well. The CDFA guidelines do tell you to bag all fruit, um, but there's a little bit of conflicting information. They say that composting should be safe because the adults are not laying eggs in fruit on the ground. So I think the largest concern with fruit on the ground, I was thinking about, for example, if you thin apricots, in like May, those could have larvae in them because they will go on slightly unripe fruit. So you just want to make sure that you're covering all of that well with a very thick layer of mulch. Um, and any fruit that's exposed runs a risk of being a food source for adults. Or if it's um, fruit that does have a larvae in it, that larvae could hatch. For using a tumbler, tumbler or other contained systems or to do vermicomposting, I think it may be a little more difficult to control flies, especially with a tumbler where you can't con cover it with a layer of mulch. We're going to do more presentations on composting in the quarantine, so stay tuned for that information. We're still trying to find out details, and that's a whole presentation in itself. And then the last thing that I mentioned already was that the fly larvae drop into the soil to pupate um, to turn into adult flies. So just if you're doing anything with your soil, or you're moving soil that might have been under fruit trees, or maybe you do cuttings. And a lot of times people put cuttings under fruit under trees because it provides like filtered light and the plants are a little bit protected. Um, if it is a fruit type tree, um, it is possible that those larvae would be falling. Now, if it wasn't a fruiting tree, I wouldn't worry about that, but just keep that in mind. So follow-up support. We're going to do uh, workshops uh, to, we're going to offer to the different cities that are in the quarantine to do in-person workshops. If you'd like to, us to bring a workshop to your organization, your community center, your um, you know senior group, your um, you know Kiwanis Club, your uh, whatever church, uh, reach out to our helpline and you can request a talk. And starting in January, we'll be 
be doing monthly online updates. So you'll check our, if you're interested, check our website. And I mentioned, um, you know, if you don't attend all of them, those ones in February and March, when you should be starting to think about your summertime planting, would be a good one or two to attend. Feel free to contact um, your Master Gardener Program Coordinator, that's me, or our Master Food Preserver Coordinator, that's D, at the website listed here. And we also put that in the chat and we can kind of help walk you through your individual plan. Um, and you can also check that CDFA website that will show the most recent map. And also you wanna check, I'll just show you real quick. Uh, when you click on that map, um, it will give you on the lower right-hand side of the map, it'll give you an effective date. So this is 1117. So if you sort of memorize that and you check the map, you'll also be aware of if it's expanded and that ArcGIS map um, shows areas like here, it was most recently expanded into Grand Terrace. So if you wanna on your own, just check that. I usually check it like once a week. Um, So um, you could check that out as well. And then if you are part of a community garden, the same rules apply about not moving fruit off the property if it's in the quarantine. Um, do you want a master gardener or master food preserver presentation at your community garden? Reach out to our helplines or our emails directly that I mentioned earlier. Um, remember that cool season veggies don't usually have fruiting bodies, so we're good for a couple months. And if you're planning to do summer fruits, uh, make sure, as I mentioned, you attend an early spring presentation for updates. So you can think about what you're planting and the scale of your planting, and if you're gonna do any preservation. If you know a farmer, especially since there's a lot of smaller farmers in or near the quarantine, um, the San Bernardino County Farm Bureau is having bi-weekly meetings every other Monday at 9 a.m. I'm gonna be adding those to the website, which is listed below, um, sbfarmbureau.com. And then the third uh, Tuesday of each month, we have meetings as well. So there's different considerations for commercial farmers. And if you know one, um, then encourage them to attend that for that scale of updates. So with that, um, this is what our website looks like. Check it out for um, those upcoming presentations. We're on social media and we'll be posting more about the fly on our social media page. Um, this is our helpline information that you can find on our website. And with that, Dee, I know we're a little bit over time, um, but I wanted to turn it over to our Master Food Preserver Coordinator now. Um, and I think, Dee, what do you think, about five to 10 more minutes and we can let people go? Yeah, I can go over it pretty quick. Okay, sorry about going over. Uh, this is my first time presenting on this and I'm learning where I, well, maybe we just need an hour and a half next time. I don't know. So Dee, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and just tell me when you'd like me to advance the slides, okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Appreciate it. Lots of good information. So um, again, um, this is Dee, and I am with the San Bernardino and Riverside County Master Food Preservers, and um, we are a division of Agricultural and Natural Resources, and just like the Master Gardeners, we are a trained group of volunteers, and um, we are basically sharing information. Um, it's research-based information about safe practices for home food preservation. And um, if I don't think I'm going to have any examples of anything specific on tonight's presentation, oh, I, I might have some names, but um, if I mention any specific names, um, it's not necessarily um, an endorsement. It's just really a name for reference for um, you, the public, to understand um, some of the products that are out there. Next. And so uh, basically we wanted to go over tonight um, how to safely share in a quarantine. Um, I um, was um, unfortunate enough to be in a quarantine a few years back. Um, sharing was not an option um, during my quarantine. So I was really happy to hear that during this quarantine, sharing is an option. There's just gonna have to be a few um, guidelines to do that. And they are still working through those guidelines. So again, as we proceed with these presentations, we'll have more updates with more specific information. Um, from what we've gathered in the meetings that we've had so far, um, juicing, freezing, canning, and dehydrating are options for you to be able to share your um, produce. And um, so keep that in mind. Um, it's um, originally um, in the early stages, they had said that if you cut it open, that was sufficient enough and that is not insufficient. So cutting it is just not um, cutting 
uh, into the fruit or into the produce is not sufficient to consider it as processed. So you have to do one of these steps that we've mentioned, juicing, freezing, canning, or dehydrating. Next. And so tonight um, I kind of focused on dehydration um, just to uh, be a little bit more specific um, since dehydration might be one that people will maybe be less familiar with out of those options that we talked about. So this is just a few pictures of some dehydrated fruit um, and uh, peas and uh, strawberries and some tomatoes. Next. So dehydration is probably the oldest form of food preservation. They've been doing it um, um, going way back. Um, and it was a way that a lot of the settlers um, would come over with some dehydrated food. Um, it's an easy and inexpensive way to be able to um, preserve your product. Uh, and it's less time consuming than canning in the sense that um, although it may take 12 to 24 hours for your product to completely finish, you don't have to sit there and baby it for the 12 to 24 hours. You kind of spend your time slicing it and preparing it and put it in. So you like set it and forget it. And then um, it's out over at the time where if you're going to be actually processing uh, through a boiling water bath canner or a pressure canner, you're going to be um, very time driven and time consumed during that process. And dehydration can actually be done without any special equipment, um, but we will talk about a few pieces of equipment here next. So uh, drying your produce, the optimum dehydrator temperature is 140 degrees or less. So at the higher temperatures, you're really cooking your food and not drying it. Um, if you're, uh, if you have herbs, um, I'm put that in there, although it's not really necessarily um, imperative for this, but just uh, for FYI, herbs are dried between 95 and 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's most effective in low humidity, which in California, we do qualify for that. And then you really want to make sure that you have a good air current. So you have that air flowing in there because that speeds up the drying and it removes the air around the food, which is what we're trying to do when we're dehydrating. We're removing that moisture out of our product. Next. So electric dehydrators, um, there are quite a few, um, and they range from um, 20, 20 bucks um, all the way up to thousands of dollars if you get a higher end one. Um, so uh, one thing that you need to be aware of is like the trays can crack or break. So be kind to them um, and they will um, last you a long time. And then the more expensive the model, the more options you'll have. So um, like for instance, on the very top uh, left-hand side, that is an Excalibur dehydrator. And that is um, out of the dehydrators that are listed here, um, are, uh, it's the most expensive dehydrator. Um, it'll be ranging between uh, $275 going up to $400, depending on if you get stainless racks or if you have a plastic rack and <laughs> lots of different options that you have available. Um, those generally come with a dial uh, a a option on your temperature and also have a timer built in on that. But you can get a lower ex lower models on the on that brand that doesn't have that. So just keep that in mind um, when you um, are purchasing one or if you're getting one or shopping for one um, at a, uh, a secondhand store. Sorry, all of a sudden my throat got very, very dry. Now, um, on the options here on the left-hand side, uh, these have the fan that are in the back. And so the air is forcing from the backwards forward. So um, you do get a little bit more, a better air circulation. Um, when you're rotating your trays, you're not gonna have to rotate them from top to bottom. Maybe just rotate them from backwards to forwards. Unlike the ones that are over here on the right where you're actually, the fans coming from the bottom. <clears throat> So those bottom racks are gonna get um, air and this, the heat and the circulation from that at a much um, faster rate than the ones that are on the top. So you're gonna to be doing some rotation in these ones that are on the right-hand side. So these circular ones. So that's kind of like the difference between those, but I, I, there's, I mean, there's good and bad in each of them. I own um, uh, both models um, that are on here. Uh, so um, I, and I like to do certain things on certain models. So uh, don't be afraid um, if you find an inexpensive one um, to give it a try. Next. So you can also dry in your home oven. 
um, which makes it very easy because again, no purchasing of equipment, but it may take you a few tries just to um, get the quirks out of it and really get to understand your oven. You need to be able to put it on the lowest temperature that you can, and then you're going to have to prop that oven open because I think some of the ovens, depending on what one you have, the, the lowest may be even too high because it might if it's 200 degrees, you're going to have to prop that open so that you can let some of that heat escape because you really just want to make it into a really dry environment. So the goal with dehydration is, is to <clears throat> dry out the food, not bake the food. That's really important that that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to remove that moisture out of the food. Next. So the preparation is that first we're going to wash and dry our produce, and then you're going to cut and slice the produce evenly. Um, this is, this is pretty key because if you don't keep your slices evenly or if you have different sizes on different trays, um, it is going to dry at a different rate. So that's pretty important when you are preparing your um, product for dehydration. Um, for the chunks or the thicker slices, and then you're going to um, cut into chunks after dehydrating. Um, it, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult. So really, if the smaller that you can get them and the thinner that you can get them with still having a nice product, um, that was, it, it's, it's ideal. And then you're going to lay them out on the trays in a single layer and spaced evenly. So you don't want to crowd the tray. Um, you just want to make sure that there's a lot of air movement in there, because if you crowd your tray, what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have uneven drying going on there. And then you can actually have some of your product get over dried. So it'll get crispy because you can, um, I, I'm not necessarily, it's not going to be burned like char, but it's going to be over dried and it's not going to look appealing and it may have a little, um, off taste on it. So next. So again, here's the setting. So this picture is from a um, Excalibur. And um, even on the Excalibur, you can see here where it's got a drying guide that tells you the temperature range. And it gives you the ability to kind of change the temperature. And then this one has a timer. Uh, so uh, it's ideally, um, you know, a timer is nice, but it's not necessarily you can get a plug-in timer um, aftermarket and save yourself some money on that. Uh, but um, remember, um, when you're drying, you want to ideally be, um, you know, be no more than 140 degrees. So you'll see that temperature range that's on here. And um, now some of those other um, lower grades aren't going to have a temperature gauge, but you still be able to um, have the ability to dry. They're just not going to be over that 140 when you might have to do a little bit of rotation. So um, not to worry if you don't get the fancy one. Next. <laughs> So dehydrating, you're going to start checking after eight hours. Now, in one of our meetings recently, um, one of the um, individuals there basically has said that they were doing some citrus drying and that they were drying them um, in about four, four hours or so. So they must have had them fairly thin slices. So um, if your stuff is on the thinner side, it's not going to hurt to check it. Um, and then if you need to, you might need to move your pieces around to prevent them sticking and realize that they are going to shrink up, um, you know, because you're removing that moisture that made the, the plumpness in that it came from moisture and you, when you're removing that it is going to shrink down a little bit. Um, so you just want to make sure that you, you kind of keep an eye on that and that you're, um, if you have some thinner slices on there, go, you can pull them off earlier. Um, if you have some thicker ones on there. So um, to check if they're done, you're going to gently squeeze and they should be a little squishy. Um, but if they stick together and they're tacky, they need to be dried out just a little bit more. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the key thing is, is that you want to make sure that you're removing um, most of the moisture in there. There is going to be a little bit of residual moisture in there, but um, not much because that's what you're doing is you're drying it out. Next. So storage and conditioning, uh, uh, when after you've finished drying something, you're going to put it in a jar and you're going to label it with a date so that you, so you have an idea of when you've um, put that up there. And then conditioning is when you place it tightly in a closed container and you leave out on a counter for about a week and you shake the jar daily um, to even out the residual moisture levels in there. And the residual moisture level is going to be maybe about 8% or so. Um, and if you see your product is sticking together or clumping together, 
um, or if you have beads of moisture at the top of the jar, um, it's that's when you're going to be a good indication that you have still too much moisture in there and you might have to dry them out um, a little bit longer. So just keep an eye on them um, for the for the first you know week or at a minimum um, three days. Um, on the counter to make sure that you do have them good and dry because there's nothing worse than going to your jar after you've dried it and then actually you've got some mold or fungus going on there because there was still some moisture in there and um, the mold yeast and bacteria um, are able to grow with that little bit of moisture. So uh, again, um, after a few days, if there's no beads of moisture, um, you can store them in a cool dry place uh, and then um, or if you're unsure you can always store them in the refrigerator uh the main thing is is it and you if you keep the air out of there that's going to make sure that you'll be able to have them um even um stored for a longer period of time so um air is key to make sure that you have that removed next so I put a picture of here persimmons on here because I know that persimmons are in season. Um, so uh, there's um, a way that you can, and persimmon chips are delicious. I've had them. Um, and I know some people that have persimmon trees and they share them with me. So um, basically you can just slice your persimmons um, and you can see that they're spaced out here on the tray where they're spaced out where you have spaces between so that the air can move freely and you're able to um, be able to dry these. And you can see that with the, the slices, um, you can see some of the, the pieces that are up in the front might be a little bit thinner. Those are gonna dry out faster. And that's why when you're checking your um, produce, when you're drying it out, um, if you see them dry, you can remove those ones off and then wait for the thicker pieces to dry out. Next. And I wanted to share a few um, useful sites here and we'll go over these in a little bit more detail in future. Uh, presentations, but the National Center for Home Food Preservation is actually a great free resource. It goes into extreme details and it goes into details where you can actually um, can the product, freeze the product or dry the product. So it's perfect um, when we're talking about things that we need to be concerned with, with dealing with this quarantine. And then also on our uh, statewide website, uh, we also have information. If you click on the resource link, um, it will bring you to publications um, throughout other cooperative extensions. Um, there's also a video section there and recipe cards. So lots of information if you have some type of produce and you're not sure what you can do or ways that you can preserve it, you can start um, at these two sites to be able to get some ideas. But feel free to reach out. Um, if you um, are up against um, a wall and not sure, and we'll see what we can do to try and help you out and try and get you through this quarantine um, safely to make sure that you can at least share your uh, produce uh, with family and friends. And I think that's it that was what I have. So and I appreciate you guys sticking on. Um, I, I know that we went over a little bit, a um, little bit information here for us. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, pop them in the chat or you have my email where you can reach me um, or you can reach Maggie if you have any information. And Maggie, did you have anything else? Yeah, I did. Thanks, Dee. And I think, um, like Dee said, this is just sort of the beginning of the food preservation side of it. So check uh, our websites for more information. If you're squeamish about bugs, I was going to give you guys a warning before the next slide. You could sort of look away for a moment. Um, if you don't like bugs, but this is a picture of the larvae um, damaging fruit. And um, so just a reminder that if you're in or near the quarantine, do not send fruit home with guests that are visiting with you. Um, and um, I'll move away from this bug slide. And just one more time, um, reiterate that if this is the quarantine boundary, and if you're in this quarantine boundary, they're asking you not to move fruit off of your property or like, for example, from a community garden back to your house without going through some of the processing methods that the Master Food Preserve Report Coordinator D shared. Um, and if you're in a core area, the re restrictions may be higher, they may be destroying fruit. And so just so you understand that there may be different levels of response, depending on whether you're in a core area, which say one is here, for example, they may have more strict regulations and that fruit may have to be disposed of. But in this general area, you should not be moving fruit off of your property um, without processing it. So we're going to be updating our websites, both of the Master Food Preserver and Master Gardener um, websites by the end of the month. 
With recipes and more information, we'll put a tab on our websites for information related to this quarantine. We're in this together. We're here to support you guys. Um, these are the different organizations that are working, you know, the University of California through the Master Gardener and Master Food Preserver Program. And they have a bunch of researchers who are entomologists who work on this on a state and local level. The Department of Agriculture, the county, the CDFA, the UC Integrated Pest Management. But in the center of it all, it is you and what you do. I think I figured out there's about 90,000 residents that were impacted by the original quarantine, it's got to be over 100,000 now. Um, even if that only represents 20,000 households, our farmers and our ag, our ability to grow oriental fruit fly free fruit, say that five times fast, um, is going to depend on how we respond now. So this is my grandma and this is my daughter. And she was passing that knowledge on and sharing that information of what she knew and so that's our role. We're at the center of um, helping to prevent the spread of this terrible pest. So that's it. Um, thank you guys again for joining. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And uh, please check out our website for future presentations. They'll start in January and we'll do a monthly update that will include both our master gardeners and master food preservers. If you um, have a topic that wasn't covered tonight that you'd like to see covered at a future presentation, please uh, email us and we'll make sure to include that in a future presentation. So thanks so much for joining. Take care.